Hello everybody and welcome back to another video. It is finally time for me to put out my first power rankings for the 2022 Overwatch League season. This is going to be my power rankings for the NA Western region only. So we have 13 teams in this region. Um, I decided to break it up between the Western and APAC region for this season uh, for two main factors. Uh, number one is the Western region is going to be having their matches kicking off first. They will be kicking off uh, next weekend, whereas the APAC matches will be kicking off, I believe, in two or three weeks. Um, so it felt like it was better to kind of do that. Um, the other reason is that the regions are going to be largely split this season. We're not going to see them uh, do much crossover until the mid-season and the end of the season, so kind of made sense. Also, there's all these rumors about the Chengdu Hunters roster getting potentially blown up and some major changes there. So I figured I would just give that a little bit more time that that situation um, settle down before I uh, rank the teams because things might change there. So this video, we're going to be going over the 13 teams in the Western region from bottom to top. I figured I would give my thoughts on why uh, the rankings are the way they are before we get into it so you guys can kind of understand where I am. Going into Overwatch 2, there's obviously a lot of questions. We don't know what to expect. The meta is still very much in flux. We've moved on from 6v6 to 5v5. I didn't get my hands on the game until a couple of days ago. So, you know, there's a lot of things that are in flux. A lot of things are kind of having to base on expectation in terms of um, scrimbucks, uh, as well as just kind of general consensus on how we feel like the rosters were built. And we're going off of a lot of kind of very, very, very unknown variables in terms of information. So this year's power rankings is very, very difficult to make, and I think the Western or the APAC power rankings, when I do get to those, will probably be a little bit clearer and easier to deduce because we'll know what to expect um, from the teams because we'll have some, some play time then. So these ones were very difficult to make, and there are going to be some things that I'm sure will be wrong. I am probably going to be very wrong with this power ranking, but I figured I would throw that out there. Ultimately, the variables that to me were the most important was how talented is your roster and how flexible is your roster. How talented I perceive your roster to be is really the most important thing. If I think a roster has a lot of talent, I think that is the thing that ultimately puts you towards the top. And then flexibility is the next thing. If you are really, really good, but you're not flexible, you're going to struggle against teams that are also really good and very flexible. Teams that are flexible, um... Even teams that are super flexible still tend to lose to teams that are significantly more talented than they are because teams that are really talented can find a meta that they like and that they can make work by forcing stuff like that. So we'll see what happens um, with some of these teams um, and we'll get into my list. You guys can kind of see my thoughts on it. Um, let me know your own list in the comments down below after you see mine. If you agree, if you disagree, all that type of stuff, I'd love to hear from you in the comments, but... With this long intro out of the way, let's get into this and jump into number 13. At number 13, I have one of the bottom teams in the Western region from last season, the London Spitfire. Despite the fact that I do think this roster did make some very important and impressive changes, adding Poco and Backbone and Admiral, who I think were three very big additions that really do improve this team in a lot of ways, and then the recent addition of Landon in that flex support role, and holding on to the pieces that I generally think were the best parts of this team last season, and a major change in the coaching staff that I think will help this team out a lot. I don't think this team made enough um, movement and change to significantly increase their stock. I know there's been some issues with getting this team together. I don't really consider it that much uh, that, that important, because I think early season performance isn't really as important as late season performance. Um, obviously, you don't want to be bad early on. You want to be good as consistently as possible, but I think this Spitfire team still has some issues. I don't think they look as strong on paper as a lot of other teams do. I think Sparker and Shax are great players. I don't think that they have an elite level player in the DPS line, which I think is potentially going to be something that holds them back in a game that looks like DPS is very important. I think Poco is the best player on this team. I think we're going to see a lot of Poco. I think Poco is going to have a lot of great um, moments. I think he is really the center of this team. He is the key piece for this team. But I just don't think this team has enough going for it to get them out of the bottom of the Western region. I don't think they're going to be fighting to get a single win for the season. I think that they will be good enough that they will compete with other teams in the Western region. I just don't quite think they are good enough to get out of this bottom spot here on my list. 
Coming in at number 12, I have the other Western Region team that was at the bottom last season, the Vancouver Titans. Now, I actually very much like this Vancouver Titans roster on paper. They moved on from all of their pieces from last season. They made, in my opinion, um, upgrades across the board, adding Aspire, bringing Shockwave back, adding Psycho to that DPS line. This is one of those places where I think the Titans are just better at the DPS line than the um, Spitfire are. I think that Aspire and Shockwave have shown star potential in ways that I don't think we've seen quite yet out of Shax and Sparker. I love the support line of Masa, Aztec, and Skyrippa. They have flexibility. They have the ability to run double flex support. They have the ability to run uh, one flex support, one main support. I think that helps them out. False on the tank line. I would have liked to see them add a main tank. I don't think it's a necessity. I think that having one tank can be beneficial. Uh, it can be something that helps you get your team working well together um, to just focus on this one tank player who false, to be fair, history on some very good teams in contenders. Obviously, someone who spent time with American Tornado and Maryville Esports. So, False is a good player. But I don't necessarily think this team has the same talent peaks as a lot of the other teams in this region do. I do think this roster is significantly better than what they were last season. I think this region is very competitive now. I don't think that a team like Paris is just going to get easy wins, you know, against Vancouver and London this season like they did last season. Overall, I'm happy with this roster. I like what it is, but it's just not talented enough in my opinion to get them out of this number 12 spot up next in the number 11 spot i have a bit of a surprising team potentially and that is the paris eternal last season the paris eternal were a very kind of good underrated underdog team that made a lot of noise throughout the season but ultimately were not really able to do much when it came to the playoffs um, or any of the tournaments the majority of that roster is still together. The only major change they made was getting rid of uh, Oni God and Suna and bringing in uh, Glister. And I think that is a great addition. I think Glister is a fantastic player. I think he brings a lot to this team. I think he's a big part of this roster. Um, and of course, they had the head coaching change. But one of the things that this team really found success in last season, part of the reasons why they were such a good dark horse team, is that half of their wins came against Vancouver and London. Those teams are not as weak as they were last season. I think that is going to make it a little bit more difficult for this Paris team to find that same level of consistent dominance. Their roster is not very flexible. They have two DPS players. They can't run double flag support. They do have the two supports uh, or two tanks. They can switch between Don and Vestola as needed. But I don't see a ton of flexibility on this team. Double hit scan isn't really possible. Naga does not play that role. Uh, so really, you're relying purely on Glister's hit scan. Like I said, support line-wise, you're running purely that main support, uh, flex support. This is a team that, from what we know, have not had the most resources thrown into them. So I think they're a team that is just a little too... I think they have talent. I don't think they're flexible enough. They're going to rely very heavily on metas that work for them. They're going to run compositions that maybe are not the most ideal because it's what they're good at. And it could be good for them, and it could definitely work. But I don't necessarily think this is a team that I feel confident enough that they're going to make a huge splash like they did last season. And so for me, I have them down here at the 11 spot. Coming in at number 10, I have the Florida Mayhem. Another team that made major changes after a pretty weak season last season. They have done a lot to try to round out their roster and have a lot of flexibility, which I do think they have done very well. On the DPS side, they have Checkmate, they have Hydron, they have XE. They can run those double hit scans with Hydron and XE. They have Checkmate to be able to run that flex DPS support line. Very flexible, two flex supports with Surma Jed and Kariv, a main support with Animo. And then they have two tanks, Adam and someone, for main tank and off tank. So I like what they have in terms of flexibility. Biggest concern for me on this roster is that there are it is a very interesting mix of veteran talent and rookie talent. You have veterans in Exe, Animo, Kariv, and to a degree Checkmate, who we've not seen play at their best in a while. Exe, of course, did not play last season was sidelined with health issues, Animo and Kariv arguably had their worst seasons in 2021, and Checkmate we only saw really on tank last season. We didn't really see him play DPS. And then you have a lot of rookie talent that I am very high on, like Hydron and Sir Majed, and someone is uh, reportedly playing very, very well. So this is a team that I have moved up in the rankings. I originally had them below Paris and Vancouver, um, but 
I think over time I've found this roster to be a little bit better. I've actually found them to have a lot of things I like about them. But I do have some concerns about some of the veteran talent. How will this support line match up to some of the other ones in this region, which I think are very, very good? It's a very veteran line. A lot of questions, a lot of concerns, where I don't think they brought in excellent veterans that are playing their best. They brought in a lot that I think are kind of towards their end. Exe may be the exception, where I think he is potentially going to be back to form. I think that's a lot of risks with these veterans and the way this roster was built. It's a mixed roster with some players who never played on mixed rosters before. So I do have concerns about it. I ultimately think it is a relatively strong roster. I think that this team has a lot of potential, but I think that there are a lot of questions and concerns that, for me, make it difficult to put them any higher than 10 on this list. Coming in at number 9, I have the NYXL. This is a very interesting roster. A roster that early on looked very, very good on paper when you have players like Flora and Yaki, who are incredible DPS talent. You pair them with Gyeongnam Jin and Myeonbong and Kellen, who are these really big names. Of course, Gyeongnam Jin and Myeongbong in that support line, Kellen in the tank line. But you kind of just wanted to see the NYXL round out their roster with some really good players. And they didn't really do that. They added one other player, Vulcan, uh, an American off-tank player on a roster that historically has always been Korean. So they have one player that is not Korean, who is going to be in that off-tank role. But I don't see the flexibility on this roster that I had hoped they would go for. They didn't add another main support player, which I personally think is a an issue. I think that you need a main support player. Lucio seems to be a very big role going forward. There are reports of them having visa issues, getting their players to the U.S., and so I think they kind of realized that they had to sign some players who were already here, which is why they added Vulcan. But I would have liked to see a player like... Sanguinar on this team. I think another DPS player was a big part of what this team needed. I think Flora and Yaki are not flexible enough to cover everything. You can't run double hit scan with this duo. You're going to basically be stuck with Tracer and a hit scan, uh, or Tracer and an Echo or a Genji, in a lot of metas. Um, Tracer, if tra if she's good, you got two good Tracers, and arguably one of the best Tracers in the league in Yaki. But if you need a Cassidy and an Ash or a Cassidy and a Widowmaker. You can't really do that. And so this roster has some really big name players on it, but the flexibility is just simply not there. I think they will struggle. I think they will get outclassed in a lot of those flexible um, areas. I think if they don't have a meta that works for them, they will struggle a lot, especially in that support line. That is my biggest concern for this team, is that they don't have flexibility in the support line that they need. If they have Gangnam Jin or Myeonbong playing main support, I don't think it's going to go as well um, as they would like to especially for a team that has some really big names on this roster. I think they have a lot of potential, but with the lack of flexibility, I just don't see them punching up as much as they could, and so I have them down here at number 9. At number 8, I have another team in a similar boat to the NYXL, though I think they are in a slightly better position, and that is the Houston Outlaws. They are more well-rounded at the DPS line than the NYXL are, which is really kind of the biggest thing for me that pushes them over the edge they do have those three DPS players. They have Dante, they have Pelican, they have Merit. Yes, they have one American player on a roster of predominantly Korean players, but we know Piggy has played on mixed rosters before. We know that Iris has played on mixed rosters before. We know Lastra has played on mixed rosters before. So I'm not too concerned about that. Pelican has as well. So the majority of this roster has played on mixed rosters before. They have the DPS flexibility with Dante, Pelican, and Merit to cover pretty much everything they would need to cover. Once again, support line is my biggest issue with this team. They don't have a main support player, so Iris or Lastro is going to have to play that. Iris is not historically the most flexible flex support player. He played a lot of Batiste last season. His Ana, his Zenyatta, not as prevalent and not as, you know, kind of strong as some of those other heroes that we've seen out of him. So Lastro would be the one to cover those for the most part, so it comes down to who plays that main support role in a lot of those cases. With no Juby, no Jake in that main support role, there's a lot of questions there. Maybe they end up having to play someone like Dante there, which, please, don't do that. That was a joke. Don't actually do that. And they have Piggy as their tank, who I do believe that off-tanks transitioning to play tank full-time will have slightly easier uh, times generally than main tanks will. So Piggy, very good season last season. I think we see a lot of D.Va, a lot of Zarya, a lot of Sigma. Then I expect Piggy to do very, very well. I also think Piggy is capable of picking up the Reinhardt, picking up the, the Winston if needed, so... I think that this roster and the NYXL roster are very similar, but I think the Outlaws are just ever so slightly more well-rounded and a little bit more 
um, flexible than the NYXL squad is, so they finish here on my list, just one spot ahead of the NYXL. Moving on to number seven, we are getting into the teams that are largely well-rounded, but have some problems here and there, and kicking off number seven, we have the Boston Uprising. This is a very bizarre team. They have a very, very loaded roster, three DPS, three supports, three tanks, and a lot of flexibility as a result. I don't fully buy into the talent, though, in some cases. They do have Striker, very well-known star-level DPS player there, um, alongside Valentine and Victoria. Definitely have the flexibility you want out of a DPS line. In the support line, they can run double flex support with Crimzo and MCD. They also have Faith, which seems like main support's a big part of the early game, at least, with Lucio being a huge part of the meta right now. So Faith being there is a huge part for this team's potential success this season. The tank line is really bloated. They have two main tanks with Itzel and Marvel and an off-tank in Punk. You only have one tank playing at a time, so it's a little odd. We don't know what to expect there. So I do have a bit of a question mark in that tank line, which to me kind of holds this team back. They have three. One of them will be good. I don't know who. I don't know if we'll see a lot of switching early on. It's a little complicated. And when you have those questions, that kind of hurts your spot on the list a bit. Generally speaking, I have faith no pun intended, in their support line and their DPS line, where they have players who, at least one player who has shown very strong performances in the past, and then at least one other player who has shown consistently high-level performances, if not exceptional, right? I think Faith has looked very good on this team. I think Crimzo has looked very good historically, and I thought MCD had some very good looks. And then Striker is arguably one of the best, if not the best tracers in the league, Paired alongside Valentine, who I thought when he was able to play the heroes he was best at last season, was a very good DPS player. And then a rookie in Victoria. So I don't think it's a bad team. I think they have a lot of good pieces. I do have some concerns for them. I don't think they're a perfect team, but generally speaking, I like what this team is. I like where they're at. And I think that they are going to have a pretty solid run in the 2022 season. Moving on to number six and the second half here of the list, we have the Washington Justice. Now, this is a team that I do think has a lot of star potential and could be a very good team, but I do still have some concerns. One of those concerns is the fact that Vigilante, who I think is one of the best players on this team, will not be of age until late in the season, so they won't have him in that flex support role. Early season will be a lot of main support flex support. They don't have that early flexibility. And while I think it's better to have main support flex support early than double flex support, Krillin and Opener, to me, are the bottom two parts of this uh, support line. I think Vigilante is the key to that support line success, and he will not be there for a good chunk of the season. Mag and Kalios, I do have some concern over as well. I think they're both talented players, and if we see a lot of Zarya getting played, or a lot of Reinhardt getting played, a lot of Winston, oh, they're going to be amazing. But we don't know for sure how they're going to work with the roster as a whole. Where I have no worries about this roster is that DPS line, between Decay, Assassin, and Happy, they cover pretty much everything, and they have three players who, in some way, shape, or form, are between top level to absolutely elite level players. I have very, very high confidence in this DPS line, and I think that they really are going to be the thing that elevates this roster potentially to being a top five roster in the Western region. But I still want to see more out of Krillin, historically not the most successful player um, in the Overwatch League. His time in London Spitfire was not amazing. And without Vigilante for the early parts of the season, I don't know how good this support line will be. Mag and Kalios are players who have potential, but we haven't fully seen it realized yet in the Overwatch League. I do think this is a very good team. I think that they really are a team that will be difficult to kind of overlook like they were last season. I think they're more consistent, and I think they're a stronger, solid roster than they were last season. But I think we obviously overhyped them a little bit last season, so I'm tempering my expectations a bit putting them down here in number six. Moving into the top five, I have the Toronto Defiant. A very interesting team that started off their offseason looking to potentially be making all of the really big moves to get them to be an elite level team. Historically have been arguably the worst team or at least least successful team in Overwatch League's history. The Defiant, I think, have done a good job of putting together a roster this season. I think their support line is exceptional. It is arguably the best in the Western region. With how good main supports look right now, Chorong and Twilight look to be an incredible duo that has a lot of potential to do a lot of great things for this team. Pair that with an 
pretty close to an elite level DPS player in Hisu, you have a very strong core of three players right there. You have Finale and Although there to support Hisu, and while I don't think they're necessarily both amazing uh, sub, uh, flex DPS players, they are good enough to give you what you need alongside Hisu. Hisu is going to give you your hit scan. Hisu is going to give you your Soma, stuff like that. Finale can help you by filling in the Tracer or the Echo or the Genji when needed, and Although fills that role as well. Um, and so you have the idea that Hisu's your star and Finale and Although are there to kind of enable him to do what he does best. My biggest concern with this team is the tank line. I'm not the biggest fan of Hoppa at this point in time. I don't think 2020 was a great year for him. And I thought he looked okay in 2021 with the fusion. But the team didn't really do much. And Muse was arguably the weakest part of the Gladiators team last season. He was good. He wasn't great. He was dependable at times. But he was not someone who excelled and elevated the team. Um, as much as I would like to see the tank line going to Overwatch 2. So to me, that really is the sour spot for this team, is that tank line. It's not bad, it's just not exciting, and I think that they could have done a much better job at going for an exciting player in that tank line. But I think it's good enough to make this team be consistently good, uh, and so for me, they are just outside the top four, ending up here in the number five overall spot. At number four, I have the team that I believe was the hardest team of any to place in this power rankings, the San Francisco Shock. When it comes to flexibility, this team does not excel in my opinion. DPS, they're pretty flexible. Kilo, Proper, Sam, that helps them quite a bit. They can run those double um, hit scan compositions that they need them. They also have a flex support with Sam, so relatively speaking, flexible there. Proper's pretty, pretty much a hyperflex, so you can run pretty much anything there. Support line, not very flexible. Uh, two flex supports, a bit of a concern there. And in their tank line, they have Kaliuj, a, an off-tank player. They don't have the main tank that they had with Super before he retired. And so I do think this is a roster that suffers from flexibility problems. But when it comes to talent, they are loaded with it. Proper could be an MVP candidate for this season, and he is most definitely a the probably the favorite to win Rookie of the Year. Violet, when he's able to play the heroes he's best at, is arguably the best flex support in the league, and I think that if he's able to be good enough on the main support, on the, the Lucio or on the Mercy or whatever he has to play, this team has a lot of potential to still do well. For me, it really comes down to that support line and that tank line, and that's the thing that keeps them from getting any higher. This is a roster with a lot of potential, a lot of really good players, but their flexibility is ultimately the thing that will hold them back, in my opinion. If they get a meta that's good for them, they could be the best team in the league. Hands down, if they can run double flex support and they can just rely on the DPS, this team will be amazing, and they will will be competing for a lot of those tournaments and a lot of those stage titles that come with the roster that they have. But I cannot justify putting them higher than these last three teams on this list, who I think have the talent very, very close, if not equal to the shock, and are significantly more flexible. So for me, definitely where we get into the realm of potential championship contenders here at number four, but the lack of flexibility keeps the shock from going any higher for me. Coming in at number three, I have the Atlanta Reign. This team, of course, finishing second in the grand finals last season and still managed to make a lot of roster changes, and roster changes that I generally think were absolutely fantastic. Completely revamped their DPS line, holding on to Kai, but adding Nero, Venom, and eventually Speedily when he comes of age. I use that as a criticism in the Watching Injustice, and I do think it does hold the reign back for a bit, uh, with Speedily not being of age right away. I think Nero is an incredible talent, and we know Nero is very, very good. We know what Nero brings to this team, and so while, yes, I think one of their best pieces will not be there to start the season, I still have confidence in the three that they have in Kai, Nero, and Venom, and they have three players to choose between as opposed to the two that the Justice have in that support line. That helps out as well. We know Venom's an elite tracer, so if you need that as well, that's something you know you're getting. I love the support line of OG and Ultraviolet. Two players have been hyped up for a very long time, finally making it into the Overwatch League, and everything that we've heard about them so far has been phenomenal, and they give you that flexibility um, to run main support and flex support, and also you can run some double hit scan, sorry, double flex support with them, Hoji, 
OG plays some BAP, so you kind of have that going for you as well. And Gator and Hawk are good tanks. Um, they're consistent. They play well. Hawk, I believe in quite a lot to be able to play a lot of those heroes um, in that tank role. Gator to cover the remaining ones that you need that maybe Hawk doesn't have as highly. Uh, you know, his skill's not as good on those. So for me, the Atlanta Rain are a very good team. I think they are one of the potential kind of favorites coming out of the Western region. I love what they've done with their roster. Uh, this roster has grown on me quite a bit since it was formed. I think as other rosters started to get formed around them, it became quite clear that the Rain had just nailed the head on the flexibility and got some really talented pieces. And so for me, this is the best roster that is predominantly Western we have ever seen in the Overwatch League. And uh, I think this team is going to do a lot of great things in 2022. Coming in at number two, the penultimate spot on this list, I have the Dallas Fuel. Overall, based on last season's performance, they were the top team in the Western region. Not the most uh, amazing performance in the playoffs coming you know, short of the grand finals, but overall, they were a very solid team last season. They had some problems last season, they had some holes in their roster last season, and they addressed those this offseason. Four DPS players, they have two that are capable of playing hitscan with Edison and Grio, a really good tracer player as well with Edison. DPS flexibility, incredibly important. Fielder and Chio give you that support flexibility as well. You can run main support, you can run flex support, which is always good. And Chio is not a bad piece when it comes to his ability to also play uh, heroes like Batiste as well. Not the best at it, but he can run it. And Hanbin and Fearless, two incredible tank talents we've seen um, play historically in the Overwatch League. So this is a roster with a lot of really good pieces. This is a team that is going to be very, very, very hard to not look at as a favorite in this region. They have stars in Doha and Sparkle, and they have stars in Fielder and in Fearless and in Hanbin. They have arguably some of the best uh, heroes at a number of different, sorry, a number of players who are the best player at their respective heroes in certain cases. Fearless, arguably the best Winston, and Fielder, arguably the best Ana, and Do uh, Doha, arguably the best Sombra, at least in the Western region, and Sparkle, arguably the best Genji. When you have players that are that elite, you can find compositions that you are just so good at and so dominant at that it gets very difficult for this team to, I think, struggle. I don't think they're a perfect team by any means, of course. There's some metas that will struggle a little bit more. I think the DPS situation could potentially become too many DPS players that they have to kind of navigate and figure out. But generally speaking, I think this is a fantastic team. I have very little doubt that this team is going to be one of the top teams in not just the Western region, but in the league as a whole in 2022. And I have them here at number two on the Western region power rankings. Finally, at number one, we have the team that I've been hyping up pretty much all offseason. I don't think many of you are going to be surprised at this spot. At number one, I have the LA Gladiators. I love everything this team has done. I think this team did a fantastic job putting together a team that is incredibly talented and incredibly flexible. There really is no meta I don't think they're prepared for. They have an elite main sport in Funny Astro, which is something that they seemingly didn't feel like they had last season in Moth. Interesting, but you know, it is what it is. Skewed is an amazing Brigitte, so if they have that need, they have that. And Shu and Skewed, of course, double flex support. You can run that very, very well. Space and Reiner are incredible tanks. You know, Space, been around a long time. Best Western uh, off-tank, arguably best Western tank, period, um, in the league. Now that Super is gone. And Space provides a ton of, you know, great play on the Diva, on the Sigma, on the Zarya. You have Reiner to cover the uh, Reinhardt and the Winston. So, really strong tank line there. And then their DPS line with Ants. Kester and Potiphon really can play anything. And when you look at this team, to me, this is a team that is stacked and loaded and is one of the best equipped teams to win it all this year. I think that they have such an incredible presence on every single spot. To me, there is no weakness to this roster. There's no weak point to this roster. Maybe um, there are some things going on um, with this roster potentially, like double hit scan, they may not be as good at as some other teams are, but they're still going to be generally one of the top teams in every meta in North America and even when they have to play internationally as well. They, to me, are the best team in the Western region, and so they 
take home the number one spot in my power rankings for North America. And that rounds out my 2022 Western Region preseason power rankings. There's the full list. You can see it there. 1 to 13, how I feel about them. I have a feeling this list is going to be super inaccurate. I'm sure some of these teams will make moves whenever they can to try to, well, make the rocks more well-rounded or, or whatnot. But it's a new game. We don't know what to expect, really. So this list is probably going to be terrible. And I'm sure many of you will not agree with it fully, but we will see over time what happens. I'm excited for the season to kick off next week. Um, it's been a long off season, so if you're excited, like me, consider liking and subscribing for more content like this in the future. Like I said earlier, comment down below uh, your thoughts on this list. If you stuck through this whole video, thank you very much. I know it was a long one, but it's power rankings time, baby. It's been a while, so figured I'd give you guys uh, a nice long video for today. That's gonna be all for me though for today. Hope you all enjoyed. Um, like I said, subscribe, like, comment, whatever for more like this in the future. But that's gonna be all for me for today. Hope you're all staying safe and staying healthy. And until next time, bye bye.